Major changes in currency cycles are not the end of the world. They're just an end of how certain things existed for a number of decades, and then there's some sort of realignment, and then it's in place for another several decades. Hello everyone, Anthony Sakuramuchi interviews Lynn Alden as she shares her latest market outlook. Subscribe now, hit that bell icon, and embark on an enriching journey toward financial success. Let's unlock the potential of these markets together and pave the way for a brighter financial future. Welcome aboard. What is going on in the world of crypto? I feel like we've had a year, you know, Lenin said that uh, in one day you can have a decade of history. I feel like we've had a decade of history in the last five business days. What's going on, Lynn? And how are you, by the way? I'm good. How are you? Good. Um, yeah. So in, in that space, I think we're seeing some broad uh, rotation of of political views. Um, uh, we're seeing potential rotations around SEC views. We'll see how that full at that unfolds in the coming days. Um, but basically, uh, you know, for a while, uh, Bitcoin was and, and kind of broadly the whole space was becoming somewhat of a partisan topic. Uh, but we've seen in, in the past week or so that there's been significant kind of bipartisan shift, a little bit bipartisan support for it. So it's not clean across party lines, which in the long run, I think is healthy. Okay. So is the ETF for Ethereum going to be approved? I think today is the day they have to make this decision. It's hard to say because, I mean, th that could get invalidated by the end of the day, but um Basically, the the people watching it closely uh, significantly increase their odds of it getting approved. Um, probably the non-staking version, um, and so basically the ETF holders would not get the staked uh, rewards that that basically people that are that are staking can get. Um, that seems to be a potential line in the sand. Um, I still think it's potentially a little while away before that happens. Uh, even though you could get some initial approval starting to come in, um, I, I think it's probably. In the long run of time, we'll probably see an ETF for it, um, just because there's already futures for it. Um, whether that extends to other assets, I, I think remains to be seen. Um, but yeah, that's I would guess probably in, in some intermediate period of time, we'd get one. But it, it's not something I follow as closely as, as maybe other people follow. Okay. So a lot of the things, I guess I follow you very closely and your book, Broken Money, and your macro views have been spot on. Uh, but there's still, in my opinion, and uh, this is a compliment, by the way, so pay close attention. They're not broadly accepted in the mainstream yet. And so you are a leading thinker and the world is coming your way, Lynn, but it's not there yet. Uh, I'm there. Uh, I read your stuff and I'm like, this is where the world's going. Why do you think that is? Why do you think we're having a hard time getting what I would call traditional finance people to understand where the world's going and understand what you're you're saying in broken money and what you're saying in your newsletters and so forth. I think a large part of it is recency bias. Uh, and so people really tune themselves over what happened over the past 10, 20, 30, 40 years, basically the span of a career, depending on, on how long they've been in the space. Um, whereas some of the some of the lessons of history that we can learn about the current period are things that are actually pretty similar to the 1940s, uh, which really only you find in history books and, and long-term data analysis and that kind of thing, rather than anyone's trading right. career, investment career. Um, and so the, the right. types of things that, or or in the modern time, it's people that have managed money in emerging markets. Uh, they're often somewhat more well-versed on these types of issues sometimes because it, it comes up more frequently. So part of it, I think, is recency bias. I, I would note that basically, over time, from talking to institutions, from seeing some of the financial media change over time, it is it is becoming more of an understanding of some of the things we're going through, some of the fiscal challenges we're going through, uh, as well as some of the things that that digital assets like Bitcoin or stable coins open up uh, to to kind of the current macro situation, how they can be helpful, how they can be disruptive, depending on how you look at it. I do think there's over time, there's more and more awareness for these things that, that I've been covering. I guess if someone were really trying to stabilize this, um, it would start with changing the structure of spending around Social Security, Medicare, and defense. You know, you kind of you have to kind of go blank sheet of paper. Do we need 800 foreign military bases? Is that keeping us safer or no? And what's the cost of all that? That's, that's that kind of thing. Then it's like, okay, so 
we have um, systematically kind of made our food less healthy, and now it's kind of ballooning into um, really high healthcare expenses on a per capita basis. If you look at Japan, I mean, they went through, they're going through a significant aging problem. They're, they're much more aged than us, but they spend something like a third per capita on healthcare and get better outcomes. Um, so clearly we have a kind of a healthcare spending is that a, crisis. Is that a polite way of saying that the Japanese are less fat than the Americans? Is that a polite way of saying it? It's a, well, that is a, that is a big contributor to it. it. It's, it's both, it's both it's eating habits, but it's also, we have a very processed food industry. So it's not like, it's not like one group just, just their willpower gave away over, over a short period of time. It's the, it's the combination of human nature with this very processed, um, kind of background structure that makes it all, all the hard choices are just really, really easy to make. So it's one, it's our food, both both individual decisions, food structure, the way we kind of structure healthcare payments, all of that results in basically just a completely ballooning healthcare expense. Um, then you can do things like mean test, social security. I mean, there's ways you can you can at least try to get that back somewhat on the track. But the, the problem, I mean, the chance of any of this happening, especially all of it happening together is exceptionally low. Um, and so I think that that's, you know, structurally, it's going to be very, very hard, um, for any, any politician, even well-meaning ones, um, to do that. And even if they get elected on that, probably as soon as they start enacting some of that, they would not, they would not win a second term because okay. people would not. Yeah, want yeah, well, that. of course. Yeah. They, people don't like the truth and they want to, they want to, they want, you know, the Republicans is interesting. The Republicans are social conservatives, but they're fiscal, they're fiscally irresponsible. You know, both sides are fiscally responsible now, but they they don't care. They want the entitlements. The Tea Party, 10, 12 years ago, there was placards saying, get your government hands off our Medicare. And then people had to point out, excuse me, that that's a governmental program. You know, what are you, what are you doing? So, so they don't care. But this is the last question that I'm going to take questions from the audience. I want you to lay out for us, as you do, by the way, what then happens. There is a looming crisis. We're going to fiddle while Rome is burning. It may be three years from now, maybe 10 years from now, maybe magically through technology and levels of productivity, it could be 15 years from now. But the exponential move on deficit spending and interest rate payments by the federal government are going to cause a crisis. That's my opinion. If, if you agree with me on that, and I can't tell you what the timing is, but it's going to happen. What does the crisis look like? How does it manifest itself? And how would somebody as an investor prepare themselves for it? So the last time that developed markets ran into a debt crisis uh, was really back in the 1940s. Um, we also see emerging markets run into them today. And so combining, you know, kind of what's happening mathematically today, what happened in the past, that gives us some view of what this kind of thing looks like. Obviously, technology is different, culture is different. There's all sorts of details. Basically, I would say that you, you start to get certain emerging market characteristics in even a developed country when you run into fiscal problems. So it's not like it's not like all the crisis happens at once. It's not like you have a pre-crisis and then a post-crisis. Uh, instead, it tends to be a, a bunch of um, uh, events that kind of culminate together. Um, and so a, a key thing that it starts out with is the central bank losing control of its own balance sheet, that it's unable to ever kind of re retain it back down. And they find themselves structurally monetizing fiscal debt uh, and always explaining why they're not really doing that, but their balance sheet's, you know, kind of going up cycle by cycle anyway at a faster rate than it used to. Um, and so that that's kind of the first step. I would say that we've been in kind of that fiscal dominant situation since around 2019, ever since we had the repo crisis that probably most most audience viewers aren't familiar with. But there was a kind of a financial plumbing issue in September 2019. I would say that kind of marks the probably some of the fir earlier effects of fiscal dominance. And that wasn't a crisis in the sense that people didn't feel it, but you know, at that, and then you had the pandemic, and then you had the, the bank issue of 2023, uh, you had the guilt crisis of, of late 2022. Um, over time, these things kind of add up. So basically what it, what it looks like is the, the difficulty of hitting a persistent 2% inflation target, which by the way, is only, that's only added recently. I mean, they, their their definition of price stability they define as two percent inflation it doesn't have to be two percent. They could they could aim for zero, but they don't. But basically, their own their own target is two percent. The way they measure it, um, you get a challenge of ever kind of sustainably getting back there. 
Um, you get money supply growth that is continuing to be significant, an inability to raise rates as much as they want to in the face of persistent inflation, um, the ineffectiveness of those rates, because again, bank lending is not the main issue. Fiscal deficits are the bigger component of the inflation that's happening. Uh, you see more protectionism. Uh, you see um, kind of like narratives, like in emerging markets, they'll say, look, it's not our fault the currency's problem. It's outside speculators are attacking it or people are are hoarding it. Or you, you kind of put the blame on some outside entity or or some small unpopular entity. Maybe you, you kind of wealthy people in general, kind of a vague group. And you say, look, that's that's why our currency is weakening. The outsiders, the wealthy, whatever the case may yeah, be. Bro. You got to have a scapegoat. Yeah. Yep. And I think basically you see years and years and years of that. Um, now, some of the more uh, kind of acute crisis happened, for example, in, in the mid 2030s, the Social Security Fund runs out. And so if that's not addressed in some way on either the spending or the revenue side, um, then basically people would only get a certain percentage of their expected benefits after mm -hmm. that point. It would only be fed by current tax revenue rather than the existing fund. So you, st you start to get these kind of mini crisis along the way, but it's, it doesn't just it didn't just go from normal to Mad Max. It, it's it basically right. anyone who studies emerging markets sees like a slow kind of train of events. So uh, investors want to know this, and it's a very simplistic question. But I'm going to ask it: Are we going to be okay? I think we'll be okay. I I, I think you you have to position yourself to be as okay as possible. Um, I think you want to you want to prepare yourself, prepare your own situation, prepare your portfolio. Uh, in any sort of changing times, there's, there are always some people that are okay and not okay. I mean that that's that's true for any period of time. Um, but basically, major changes in currency cycles are not the end of the world. They're just an end of how certain things existed for a number of decades, and then there's some sort of realignment, and then it's in place for another several decades. So it is. I would say it's disruptive. But there are multiple ways to, to be okay on the other side of it. Thank you for watching the interview highlights of Lynn Alton. If you enjoy this highlight video, please kindly subscribe and help share this video for us to share more of this valuable content. Thank you.